for our study today. We are going to be focusing on the life of, we're continuing our focus on the life of Abraham. And then we are also going to be looking at his relationship with his nephew Lot. Some interesting details that maybe we haven't thought of before that, uh, before today for this study. And then we'll be looking at the mysterious Melchizedek and, and where he shows up this one time here in Genesis in chapter 14. And then we will uh, consider his, his returning to the scene in the New Testament, some things that are said in Hebrews uh, concerning him. Thank you for being here with us as we continue to walk through history, the, the, the story of God in the book of Genesis in the beginning. There were tre- uh, tremendous and incredible tasks that were accomplished by God in the creating of the world, and he then gave us the, the duty and the responsibility to continue that work here on this earth, and we are thankful to God for the blessings that he has given us to continue in the work, to live in this world, and to reflect his image and to have rule over this creation, and we are so thankful to be able to participate in his divine purposes, and we see that being given here in the book of Genesis. I am thankful to have my friend Alan Sinestrang here on the screen right below me. He's going to be helping us walk through the text of Genesis chapter 13 and 14. As I said, we're going to be looking, uh, continue our look at Abraham and his nephew Lot, some interaction that takes place between them in chapters 13 and 14, and as, as I mentioned again, we'll be looking at Melchizedek this afternoon. Alan, how are we doing today? Doing well? Doing, doing well, doing well. Great. Great. Enjoying the nice weather today. And Hey, it is a beautiful day. Cannot complain at all about a day like this. We barred your dogs today, so that was good. Hey, I'm sure they are having a blast. I know your wife, Melanie, is having, <laughs> having a blast having some, some doggy companions over these few days. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're, we are in Middle Tennessee visiting my in-laws for a couple of days. They've been real troopers during this whole process and doing good job good job of sheltering in place and and uh, they haven't seen their grandbabies in about two months and we figured with things starting to open up a little bit we could come and, and spend some time out in the country where they live in middle Tennessee and we're enjoying being here but we're thankful to be able to continue to do these studies and that's one of the great things about t- technology you know we've been doing these remotely already I've been at, at the church house in my office for the most part Alan's been in, in his kitchen or in I guess in his dining room but with me not being in Jackson right now, being at my in-laws' house, they have good Wi-Fi connection. We're still able, able to do do the show. As <laughs> That's well. all you need. Hey, we're we're going to make it work, man. We're going to make this work. Uh, no matter where we are, we're going to try to try to get this class taken care of, and we're thankful for the opportunity to do that. All right, Alan, let's get into Genesis 13 in this afternoon. Genesis 13 and 14. You said you would like to read Genesis 13. I would love to give you the opportunity to do that. Why don't you read to us? About Abraham and his his nephew Lot's their interactions, and that will get us going for the study this afternoon. Genesis thirteen. If you remember, just looking back a little bit in Genesis uh, chapter twelve, right at the end, uh, there was a famine, and Abram and his uh, his family had had to go down to Egypt. Uh, didn't turn out very well at all. So now, at this point, they're heading back uh, heading back up from Egypt. And that's where we pick up in chapter 13. And we're going to be introduced to Lot, to reintroduce. We kind of saw him a little bit right at the end of chapter 11. Uh, We know that he is the nephew of Abram, uh, but we haven't really heard much from him. Uh, We're assuming he went with Abram down into Egypt and back, but he's just not mentioned until now. But now they're heading back up, and we're in verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 13. Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev. He, his wife, and all he had, and Lot with him. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver and gold. He went by stages from the Negev to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had formerly been, to the site where he had built the altar. And Abram called on the name of the Lord there. Now Lot, who was traveling with Abram, also had flocks, herds, and tents. But the land was unable to support them as long as they stayed together. For they had so many possessions that they could not stay together. And there was quarreling between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were living in the land. So Abram said to Lot, please, let's not have quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, since we are relatives. Isn't the whole land before you? Separate from me. If you go to the right or go to the left, I will go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. 
looked out and saw that the entire plain of the Jordan, as far as Zoar, was well watered everywhere, like the Lord's garden and the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose the entire plain of the Jordan for himself. Then Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated from each other. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, but Lot lived in the cities on the plain and set up his tent near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were evil, sinning immensely against the Lord. After Lot had separated from him, the Lord said to Abram, Look from the place where you are, look north and south, east and west, for I will give you and your offspring forever all the land that you see. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust of the earth, then your offspring could be counted. Get up and walk around the land, though its length and width, for I will uh, through its length and width, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and went to live near the oaks of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. All right, Alan, thank you so much. So as we're continuing looking at at the story of Abraham and his life after God appears to him and makes some grand promises that he would inherit a great land and that his great descendants, a great number descendants, that they would inherit that land and that through his his uh, his seed that all the nations of the, of the world would be blessed. So not just Abraham's descendants, not only would they be blessed, mm-hmm. but the whole world would be blessed. All the families of the world would be blessed. We see him, as you mentioned, they have gone down to Egypt and they had a little bit of a rough time there. Uh, mostly because Abraham didn't make some of the best choices possible. But we see him getting back into into the land that we're familiar with. The, the, the Bible story, the vast majority of it takes place in this particular land, the land that is referred to as Canaan, which is north of Egypt. It is to the west, or excuse me, to the east of the Mediterranean Sea. And as we get back up here and his, his nephew Lot is with him, uh, I want to first note... The very first thing I want us to note is as we trace where he goes, that he goes from Egypt to the Negev, and then he goes from the Negev to Bethel, uh, this place between Bethel and, and Ai, where he set, uh, where his tent had formerly been. So he's returning to a place he's been before. But I want to notice verse number four specifically, that to the site where he had built the altar, and Abraham called on the name of the Lord there. That sounds familiar, Al- Alan. Mm-hmm. Have, we, have we seen this before? I think we have. Where have we seen it before? <laughs> well, we've, uh, of course, this whole thing is just a complete reversal from when he went down to Egypt. Mm-hmm. If you look back in chapter 12, verse 8 and 9, um, it's the complete opposite of the journey mm-hmm. that he that he went on. He left Bethel and Ai. He had already built an altar there. He went through the Negev down to Egypt. Now we're going, retracing our steps back through the Negev back to uh, the same altar where, where Bethel was. And even uh, in that verse 8, chapter 12, verse 8, uh, he call, it says he called upon the name of the Lord there, I believe. Is that the only one? There might have been one more, I thought. There's at least uh, th- one. That's one here. So in, in, chapters, in chapter 13, we see two instances where Abraham okay. seems to pause to give focus to God, one being here in chapter 13 and verse 4, and then the other one being at the end of chapter 13 and verse 18, uh, right. and I, I completely blew over what you're referring to in chapter 12 and verse 8, where it, the exact same language is referred to in regards to what Abraham did. And I, I guess I'm thinking back even further that this is not the first time that we've seen someone mm-hmm. participate in this type of language calling on the name of the Lord. It is seeming at this point to be a pattern of Abraham to do so. That You do it once, okay, it happens. Do it twice, now we're moving towards a pattern we see it again. I, we, not the same language. I'd say probably the same idea that there, there's a time where he's focusing on God is seen in, in verse 18. So it seems to be a pattern of Abraham that as he's moving around and as he begins to settle, he wants to make sure that he t- takes time to focus on God and to give him proper respect. But the one I was thinking of was his, uh, I'm, not, I'm not even going to try to say what grandfather, this would, <laughs> Great right, grandfather. What, what grandfather this would have been, but in chapter 4 and verse 26, the first time we see this language mentioned in the book of Genesis, which we'll mention this is not the only time we see this language in the Bible. Mm-hmm. In the Bible we see this language again a number of places. We see in the book of Romans. We see in the book of Acts, chapter 22, and verse 16, where Ananias tells, tells Paul, or Saul at the time, why do you awake, get up and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Well, the very first time we see this is in Genesis chapter 4, and verse 26, 
that a son was born to Seth and also uh, was born to Seth also, and he named him Enosh. And at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. So we see people giving proper respect and and do do reverence to God. And this is continued from Enosh. However many years it is past that, you probably know a little bit better than I do. I do to where we've now rested in chapter thirteen. We see Abraham continuing this trend of human beings taking time to call on God's name and to give him due, due respect and reverence. I think this is uh, the, the instance with Seth and his generation and then Abraham here. Um, we see that calling or to call on the name of the Lord. This isn't a one-time thing. Right. Um, you wouldn't say calling on the name of the Lord and that just be once. That's a, I guess, present progressive. That's something you're doing consistently you know, now and in the future. Well, Abram, he's done it twice now, you know, the the same phrase, uh, two different places. Well, mm-hmm. if this was one of those one-time things that needs to be done to be saved, then why is he doing it twice? Well, I think the answer is that this is a, this is a lifestyle of his, uh, to call on the name of the Lord. This isn't one thing you do just once. This is what something you do every day. Uh, your entire life, you call on his name, you appeal to his name for um, for help, for grace, for mercy, for forgiveness, whatever it is, all of that can be wrapped up into calling on the name of the Lord. Right, and this, this would have been a, as we noted in our last study, this would probably have been a change for Abraham, because what it seems like, based upon the scriptures of, of his family, that they were not worshipers of, of the God who will Become, who will come to be known as the God of Israel. They seem to be worshipers of just random random deities, if, if you allow that type of language, uh, not the one true and living God. So for him then to make this shift is showing that once God comes to him, makes these promises, Abraham does have a very, a very distinct change in his lifestyle and change in the way he thinks, obviously a change in his theology, his understanding of, of divine beings. And I think that is something to, to, highlight just the fact that for us again if we're thinking about abraham especially the way he's described in the new testament he's so often seen as this just incredible figure who never made any mistakes and who always did the right thing who was just this godly person for godly sake godliness sake and yet we come back here and we read the origin of abraham where he came from he came out of a, a pagan worshiping family and he made a number of mistakes along the way but who he was trying to be, I believe, who, who he was truly trying to be, was a God-fearing person. Mm-hmm. That, that, does, that doesn't mean he never made mistakes. He did. But at the core, that's who he was. And at least for me, that, that gives me some, some hope. It, it, just knowing myself and knowing my own shortcomings and my own weaknesses, that, that, the, that what I experience as a person in my weaknesses and in my shortcomings, that's not... That's not something unique. It's something that is experienced by all, all people, even those who are trying to live godly. There are going to be times whenever we make mistakes. And normally those, I wouldn't say normal, I say every time those mistakes are made, true mistakes. They're made because we've simply taken our, our eye off where it needs to be, which is on God. That our focus has been shifted elsewhere, that we've relied on our own strength instead of God's strength, that we've, that we've sought after our own, our own desires instead of God's desires. So it is possible for someone who is a godly man who, who an entire civilization, an entire nation is founded upon, who is a godly person, if he can make mistakes because he just made mistakes, then for me, I take solace in, I'm able to to get back to where I need to be, just as we're going to see him, this kind of climax. I, I wish I would have saved that chart that you had, <laughs> the, the up and down roller coaster of <laughs> Abraham. Though it was up and down, I hope you will notice that it was still moving upwards. Yeah. It's still, it still going up. And I, I think that shows something that, that in this journey that we're all on, and we could really call this Abraham's journey, because not only is he moving, literally moving from place to place, but he's also moving and developing as a person. And yeah, there's going to be some low points. There are going to be some high points. But each low point leads to a higher high point and moving up to where he needs to go, which is what we're going to see finally once we get to Genesis 22. I just think we should be impressed by Abraham and the the improvement that he's making. Though there are mistakes, the improvement still needs to be noted, and I think that could bring us some some encouragement. One of the things that uh, what we're going to see right here 
is that Abraham takes a a mature position in mm-hmm. this difficulty that he's having with his nephew and his nephew's herdsman and the ne- Abraham's herdsman himself. Alan, you know, we love our families, don't we? We love our families <laughs> and we we love uh, we love our immediate families, we love our aunts, we love our uncles, we love our our cousins, we love our nephews and our nieces. But there just some time. There's just there, there comes a point sometimes whenever things just aren't going to be well unless we take some time to separate, right? That seems to be what's going on here in in the story of Abraham and Lot. They, there needed to be separation for at least a time. And and how does that come about here, Alan? Beginning in chapter thirteen, verse five. Well, of course, it kind of gives us a little hint with uh, verse two. We're told that Abram is very rich, and then. Uh, verse five. Now, Lot is also pretty mm-hmm. rich. He's got a lot of a lot of property, a lot of herds and things. Um, it's it's really interesting just to think about. There are still there are people in Canaan at this time. There's mm-hmm. cities. There's other people, but uh, just this language. It's like it's almost like there's no one there, and yet there's still not enough land. There's still not enough room. So I think it highlights just how great, how much. Yeah how richly blessed Abram and Lot at, by an extension, uh, have been. And, and to highlight the difficulty, you know, we haven't really talked much about Lot yet, but think about who he is. He is the, he is the nephew. He is the son of Abram's, uh, likely older brother mm-hmm. who has died. So, you know, the last from that family, Lot has traveled with him. He's been loyal to Abram. He didn't stay behind like the other brother did. Lot went with Abram all the way from uh, from the east, from Haran. He came to he came to Canaan with them. He traveled. It seems like he traveled down to Egypt with them. He has he has stuck by his side. And if you remember the promise that Abram had back in chapter twelve, I will make you a great nation. Um, you know, a blessing. Well, a great nation requires offspring. Mm-hmm. There's that's obvious. Well, Abram doesn't have any offspring, at least physically from his, you know, that are, you know, blood offspring from him and Sarah. So you got to think, you know, because the Lord hasn't quite specified exactly what offspring means. You got to think that Lot was his heir, uh, more legal heir or like an adoptive son for him, Mm -hmm. which I mean, that would that would have been fine. You know, that's no different if I adopt adopt a child that's no less my child than someone that you know my wife bears herself i mean that's still a child but i wonder if abraham considered lot to be the uh, the fulfillment of that promise and that through lot and his family and his offspring that this promise would occur so so the fact that they're separating right now is almost i think kind of a blow to abram and and definitely a leap of faith for him uh, just knowing that God, what God promised and mm-hmm. what Lot was likely supposed to be, or at least in his eyes, supposed to be, or could have been. Um, but of course, you know, they, uh, Abram again is probably the head of the family here. So he shows, like you mentioned, he shows, uh, he shows great, uh, magnanim, magnanipi, Oh man, I can't even say that word. I have no idea what word you're trying to say, so I can't. Oh, I can say it. I I had it a minute ago. I know all those big words, man. But he shows he shows great uh, restraint and and just love for Lot, uh, just giving him first choice. Mm -hmm. Uh, Abram by by rank should have been the first choice, or should have had first choice. But uh, but he gives that to he, he gives that to Lot, and and Lot of course looks everywhere. He looks across. And he sees he sees the best ground here. And notice how it's described in, in verse 10. Uh, the plain of the Jordan, it was well watered everywhere. And it's described like the Lord's garden, I think, talking about the Garden of Eden, and also the land of Egypt, which uh, you kind of get, get that idea. We talked about the dangers of Egypt and how Egypt, that, that place, would kind of represent just great physical security. Well, that's, that's how they viewed it here. It was, you know, as rich and as fruitful as the garden of Eden. Uh, so this area was just like that, but you get all these little, um, little teasers that obviously would, uh, would set off 
uh, set off alarm bells in your mind. Uh, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, it's, he pitches his tent near Sodom, and the men of Sodom were evil, sinning immensely against the Lord, verse 13. So if you've never, if you've never read the rest of the story of Genesis before, you've never heard of Sodom and Gomorrah, yeah. I think this is enough right here to know, like, okay, you know, file that away in my mind. They're going to come up again. Uh, this can't end well with with Lot. Yeah, uh, you had mentioned that the other day, or you sent me a text, I think, as we were preparing for, for this study, uh, about the fact that Lot might have been able to participate in the the Messianic lineage. And in Nathan Ward's uh, commentary, his notes on Genesis, he he draws that conclusion based upon some of the cultural understandings at that time. He says that Mesopotamian law codes allowed for the adoption of an heir in case of childlessness. So at this time, as Abraham has been has been promised that a nation will come through him, he is just looking at what is presently before him, and he's trying to draw some conclusions about how can this happen. Well, at the time, he's childless. So he's thinking, okay, how could this happen? Well, if I look at what's before, what's in front of me right now, the only thing that's in front of me is a nephew who would have been blood related to Abraham to some degree because they uh, Lot's father Haran would have been Abraham's brother. They would have shared blood, obviously blood lineage. Therefore, Lot would have had some blood lineage from from Abraham uh, that could carry on his, his seed, as was the promise in Genesis chapter twelve. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's something else that that Nathan notes here in his in his notes. He says. He just asked the question, well, well, could Lot have been the heir? And if we're looking at how things were to begin with, we have to think, well, it's a possibility, and that could have been the way Abraham was thinking about it, which, as you know, this would have been a, a sad time for him, the fact that they're separating. And further evidence for that is the fact that Isaac is not specifically promised to Abraham until chapter 17. So before Isaac is mentioned specifically, specifically by name, Abraham's just probably trying to think, as, and I can't blame him. I'd be trying to figure this out, too, exactly how is God going to do this. How am I going to have an heir? First, he tries Lot. Lot doesn't work out. They separate. Couldn't be Lot. Uh, well, no, I want to highlight as well that Lot was a good man. He was a righteous man. Mm -hmm. He was a God-fearing man. Peter refers to him as a righteous man in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8. So it would have, it could make sense that the lineage could have gone through Lot. Um but secondly, after it didn't work out with Lot, what are we going to see Abraham try to do to try to get this worked out? Well, then it comes in Hagar and Ishmael uh, in chapters 15 16, and 16 before, before Isaac's even mentioned in chapter 17. So you can just see it. And if you, if you try to put ourselves in Abraham's shoes, what we want as people today is understanding. We want to be able to understand and comprehend how are things going to work? How are things going to play out? And should we should we fault Abraham for having those same types of feelings and desires? He wants to know, hey, how exactly is this going to work? How can I have an heir when I am already well advanced in age and my wife has been barren the entire time that we have, we have been married? How could this happen? What? Possibility? They separate, that's out the window. Sarah's still wondering, how are we going to have a child? Here, why don't you take, and we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, so forgive me for that. But here, take my, my handmaid and let her be your wife, and you have a child through her. Well, that doesn't work out either. That ends up not, not being the heir. And then finally, after Abraham is trying to wrap, wrap his mind, trying to comprehend, well, how is this going to happen? Then the Lord steps in, and he says, listen, this is how it's going to happen. And even at that point, whenever the Lord says specifically, you, you are going to have a son through Sarah, and his name is going to be Isaac, even their response then is, is <laughs> silly, I guess. Uh, Abraham <laughs> laughing, and then Sarah laughing again a, a chapter or so later. It, it, I, I think it is so important for us to try to put ourselves in the shoes of these characters. And instead of sitting back and being able to look back and, and have that twenty twenty hindsight, and really nitpick and critique and say, well, how, how in the world could you ever do that? Why, why would you ever think that Lot could be the heir? Why would you ever think that Ishmael could be the heir? 
well, put yourselves in their shoes and you're thinking, yeah, I, I kind of get that. That that makes sense. But then you have these, these, these instances, as you brought up, where Abraham shows great character, where he, being the patriarch, has the right to choose the better land. And instead of doing that, he gives that, that blessing to Lot. And you were talking about earlier, Lot probably being in Egypt with, with Abraham. Well, my question is, how would he know that this area was fertile like Egypt if he had not been in Egypt? I mean, he, would, he would have True, to. Yeah. He, would, he was probably there to be able to take in and see just what that land was like. Therefore, he's able to say, well, it's like Egypt. Then obviously, somebody might argue, well, he wasn't in the garden. But you know those stories have been passed down through generations, how the garden was, and even as as Moses is writing this text, he might also just be referring, helping the reader to know that's that's exactly how how this land was that it was fertile. Speaking of the garden, um, just a kind of a quick little note here in, in verse ten of chapter thirteen, mm -hmm. you get some garden language in there. Um, can you think of someone who also looked and saw something uh, ha, ha, ha. that was pleasing to the eyes That's and good. then chose chose that uh, for himself? So you get a, you get some little parallels there, which That's great, I think it's a great observation. Tougher to see, tougher to see, you know, in a translation of it, but I'm sure it's probably a little bit easier in the Hebrew for them to recognize those same types of mm -hmm. words. And you know, again, alarm bells. Uh oh, this is this is Eve choosing the fruit all over again. This is not going to end well. So, so you see Lot's choice of where he chooses, and even, I mean, he choosing to leave. I don't think that was necessarily um, required that he that he separate or he do so for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, if he, I think, if he really understood the the blessings that Abram had and the blessing and the blessing that comes from associating with him then he never would have left because after he leaves, it's just downhill from here. So it, it's the grass looks greener on, in right. the valley, but it doesn't end up being that way. That's right, especially as in, in the fact that in Genesis 12, those first three verses, God says explicitly, those who bless you, I will bless. Lot and Abraham, as best I can tell, have had a good relationship. It was not the uncle and nephew who were having these quarrels. It was just about their herdsmen and the flocks that they that both these men were so abundantly blessed, and yet for whatever reason they were kind of both stuck in the same space. <laughs> maybe if they would have just put a little bit of space between them, and and I mean maybe stayed in close proximity, this could have turned out differently. But the that lust of the eyes, that seeing something that is great, and desiring it simply because it is great, regardless of of the surrounding circumstances. I wonder, I wonder if, if at this time, whenever, whenever Lot is making this decision as he's, he's serving, he's serving this, this choice before him. Okay. I can go this way. or I go that way. This way is towards Sodom and Gomorrah. It is a beautiful place. It is a lush place. It is a place with, with great prosperity. Did he know at the time, the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah? Do we know that? I'm thinking, I I don't know if we could say that with certainty, that he knew the wickedness. Because I, I think if, if, whether he does or doesn't, that adds another layer to, to this decision-making process. Um, and at least the results that come from it. If he did not know, then a lesson we could take from this is just because something looks pretty and is great, mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's always going to turn out well. If he did know, then the lesson would be, to sacrifice godly circumstances in order to live in ungodly circumstances and yet gain some sort of physical blessing, that, that's not a wise thing to do. So depending, I guess, his knowledge of Sodom and Gomorrah at this time would determine which, which lesson we take away from it. I don't know if we know with certainty, so both lessons, I guess, are there before, <laughs> him, regardless of what, what the truth of the matter is at this time, what he knew. Yeah. I don't know about this time, but definitely um, he learned pretty quick what they yes. were like. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yet we still we still see a progression. It says here that he pitched his tent near Sodom in chapter yes. 13, yes, verse 12. Mm -hmm. Later on, we'll see that he ends up, the next time we see him in the next chapter, um, he was 
living in mm-hmm. Sodom mm-hmm. in chapter 14, verse 12. So he's he's gotten close enough to see what they're like, and yet he still moved into the town. Yeah. And and even after the events of chapter 14, he's still going to be there mm-hmm. later on when Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. So um, he's he knows what it's like, and yet he's he's decided to stay for whatever reason. Yeah. So at that point, lesson number two of the options there would told would completely be in play and it's not worth physical blessings or a lush land, a land of prosperity. If you are engulfed and surrounded by ungodliness, which eventually, eventually is going to have an effect on you. And that's the thing. That's the thing that again, forgive me for jumping ahead a little bit. Once we get to the whole issue with Sodom and Gomorrah, even if we're living in an ungodly place and even if we're able to survive in that ungodly place without being influenced and becoming ungodly in a way ourselves, we have to imagine that the ungodliness at some point is going to have a negative impact on us. Even, even if it's not, we're influenced to do it ourselves. Just the negative consequences that often come with ungodliness are going to have some sort of impact on us. So it, it would be, wise if if at all possible to avoid that type of environment as best we can that's a good segue into uh, chapter 14 right there (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) i mean you're talking about because i think once we get to chapter 15 we'll come back and we'll we'll hit more of what we see in in 13 and 14 through uh 17 where where he reaffirms Mm -hmm. because there's a series beginning here in 13 and 13 and verse 14 and then going into chapter 15 where we see these promises reaffirmed, we'll come back to that. But yeah, we get here into the to what's going on in, in chapter 14 of the book of Genesis, this beginning book of the Bible, which sets the foundation for the story of God and the story of mankind, the story of this, this plan that the Lord has set in motion for the redemption of mankind, to restore mankind back to their original state, which is living in the image of God and, and reflecting all of his wonderful characteristics. As we're looking in this story... We get here to Genesis 14, and we have what is really, it's like the wild, wild west. I mean, it's, just, it's a bunch of gunslingers and bad dudes and just a whole bunch of chaos going on. And yet this is the situation that a, that Lot finds himself in. Remember, we're in chapter 13. He sees this land, and as the text describes, it is well watered everywhere, like the Lord's garden, the land of Egypt. And he's thinking, this is where I want to live. So he makes his way toward in, in that direction, towards the city. And as I said, though he might not be influenced in himself to behave in this manner, the behavior of the people in the land, they're going to have a negative impact on him. And we have all this just, I mean, craziness. Let's see here. We have uh, one king, two kings, three kings, four kings on one side. So we have the king of Shinar, the king of... Uh, Elisar, the king of Elam, and the king of Goim, and they're waging war against the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, the king of, of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and then also the king of Bela, which is Zoar. And they're all, had this, so you have four kings on one side, five kings on the other side, and they're having this great war, this, this, this battle. And I would assume. I mean, I assume this battle would be would be fought over just land and, and prominence within within the play within this region. And here is Lot. And Lot finds himself stuck in the middle of it. What does Lot do uh, in this moment, Alan, whenever he finds himself stuck in the middle of this Wild West shootout of sorts, <laughs> Genesis style? Well, he doesn't do much. It's uh, it's Abraham that does all the <laughs> That's right. that does all the doing right. here. So uh, so you have the four kings. Uh, do you have that map ready? We have yes. four kings that are coming over from uh, the region of Babylon, the region of the rivers over there, kind of where Abraham originally started. Uh, if you notice, Shinar. Remember, we last saw the name Shinar back with the Tower of Babel, Babel mm-hmm. the plain of Shinar. So you have these this coalition of four kings. They come over and they are attacking this coalition of five kings, mm-hmm. which it seems like the five kings had been paying them tribute for, I think it says 12 years, and they finally, they quit. They rebel against them. So that's that's the reason for this, uh, this invasion yes. mm-hmm. of the four kings coming over. 
So the five kings, Sodom and Gomorrah and some other cities in the area are allied together and they just get they just get destroyed. Uh, the four kings come in it, it very detailed description of this campaign that comes mm-hmm. through here, which is uh, which I think is is interesting. But the four kings come in, they attack, they uh, they win the battles. They eventually they take a uh, tribute and goods from from Sodom, uh, food, and amongst those amongst that uh, amongst those uh, those winnings were Lot and all his possessions because they were in Sodom as well. So they. Lot just gets caught up in the middle of this, uh, in the middle of the trouble, mm-hmm. and yeah. they take him a good a good distance. If you can see that, they take him all the way. It says almost all the way to Damascus, which is if we're going from probably South way Dead Sea uh, toward the bottom of your map there, all the way to Damascus. That's a pretty pretty long trip. So he's yeah. he's a prisoner of war for a good while and a good journey. And Abram's not too far away from where Lot is, but he has to travel uh, travel a good while to get to to get to him. So, so we see Abram in verse thirteen. He hears about what happens. Uh, Abram has made a few friends there as well that uh, that he's living near a guy named Mamre and his brothers. So they it seems like they kind of went they went with them, helped him out. So you have this uh, you have this impressive force of 318 trained men uh, which goes to show the immense the immenseness of abram's house right i mean if he had 318 trained men just I mean, trained. Thinking, that, that's on everybody just that's trained. just the warriors yeah so i mean multiply that by four or five the number of people that are in abram's household that he mm-hmm. is over you I mean probably you know two thousand three thousand crazy people. to think about that that Easy. All those people would be considered the household of Abraham. I mean, to me, that's like a whole town. <laughs> but, but that's just, just <laughs> oh, his yeah, family. Yeah. Incredible blessings. But remember, 318 men against four kings and however huge their armies were. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's got to be 318 against an army of minimum, what, 10,000 men, 20,000? I would have been imagine. a number for sure, yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine making this long invasion and and doing so well and not having a huge force. So this is still, even though 318 is a lot, that's you know nothing compared to what this uh, this alliance has. Yet we see Abram is able to uh, pursue him as far as Dan, uh, chapter 14, verse 15. He deploys his servants uh, by night and is able to defeat them and bring the goods, including Lot. Uh, back to back to the cities as well as the women and the other people. So God um, is with God is with Abram in this in this adventure. Yeah, I have a, a note that says this would have been about 120 miles, 120 mm-hmm. mile journey from from where Abram was all the way up to Dan. I mean that that's a long, that's a long trip. I mean that's a couple of hours driving driving for us. Now think of marching. With all of your supplies and with that large of a, of a crowd, that would have been a, a very that would have been a substantial journey for these men to to undertake. And then once they get there, they have to fight and to to try to overcome the armies that that waited for them. Uh, but how 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 is it that Abraham or Abram at this time? How is that he and his companions in this case would have been able to do so? It does seem they are outnumbered. Uh, although we'd have to think that after the fighting that's already taken place, these these forces they were going up against, they would have been depleted somewhat because of the fighting's already happened. But th- th- this, to me, is showing the Lord being with Abr- Abram. The Lord is blessing him and strengthening him. And remember, a lot is a righteous man himself, and he he would he would have been one who had been faithful to God. So the Lord here is able to be with him. And we're kind of reading in between the lines here, but I, th- I think that would be an accurate thing to to claim. Uh, and yet it brings us now to, to chapter 14 and verse 17, where we're introduced to another king. This time his name is Melchizedek, the king of Salem. But simply him being a king is not the most important or the most interesting characteristic about this man. Alan, if, if you would like to read for us uh, those verses that you want to read uh, and give us a little bit of information, that will lead us into this text where we start talking about uh, Melchizedek a little bit more. All right. 
Uh, verse 17, it says, After Abram returned from uh, defeating Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the Sheva Valley, that is the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God Most High. He blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. You you see, as Abraham returns, you have he has two kings come and meet him. Uh, one we've already seen, the king of Sodom, and then the other is going to be this king, uh, Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is pretty certain to be talking about Jerusalem. So mm-hmm. that city would have been fairly close to this area, closer to where Abram uh, yeah. Abram resides in uh, Hebron at this time. So pretty a pretty close neighbor uh, neighbor to him. They would have, I guess, known each other. Is why Melchizedek came and. And met him, but the interesting thing is not that he's the king of what would eventually be Jerusalem, is that he's described as this priest to God Most High. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that's extremely interesting because whenever we think of the the patriarchs and and those patriarchs who have covenants with God, and it's important to recognize that's how God's working among men at this time, and that's the way we've seen all the way up until this point. I know sometimes it's easy to conflate maybe the Old Testament being completely um, involved in the old law. I've heard people, people speak like that before, and I probably even said something along the lines at the time. Well, if you want to learn about the law, just go read the Old Testament, as if the Old Testament is encompassed by the law. But the law doesn't come in. The, the law, and what's interesting, the law of Moses is not mentioned at all in Genesis. And isn't through it isn't until halfway through Exodus that the law is introduced. So the question then becomes, how is God operating and interacting with mankind up into that point? We look in the garden. In the garden, there was the covenant that he had with Adam and Eve, which was established with a man and his his wife and family. Then we get to Noah. There's a covenant established between Noah, his wife, and, and his family. We see another covenant being established here with Noah, or excuse me, Moses and his family. And then we have somebody just seems to me at least to be kind of out of left field. This guy out of nowhere, this this Melchizedek is introduced into the scene. And it's not just that he's introduced kind of as Abraham or Noah might be introduced just as a, as a righteous or a holy man, a blameless man. But he is introduced specifically as a priest to the Most High God. So it is explicit here that he serves Yahweh, and that he serves Jehovah God, the God who is going to become to known as the God of Israel. Alan, how, how, does, how does that make any sense? What, what, what does that teach us about God's relationship with people during this time? Well, with Melchizedek, it's, there's more, more than meets the eye. There, yes. We just don't know <laughs> yeah. what's going on with Melchizedek. Yeah. But, uh, I think it's clear. Yeah, obviously he's a priest. He's worshiper of the same God that Abraham worships, because uh, in verse twenty-two he calls him by the same name, God mm-hmm. Most High, Creator of heaven and earth. So they're talking about the same two here, mm-hmm. and uh, it's just it's just interesting to think about where. And that's that's what gave I think the the Jews trouble when they were considering this text and considering who this was. The fact that this Melchizedek comes out and Abraham gives him a tenth. Well, you don't give a tenth to someone that is less than you. A tenth was reserved for the priesthood or for deity. So clearly, Abram acknowledges the the higher rank of Melchizedek in this in this passage. Well, how can if this is just a king from a Canaanite city at this time? has no blood lineage or connection to Abram in what way like that just that wouldn't make sense at all like there right. has to be some some reason or some connection that makes Melchizedek greater and that's where I think you get some erroneous theories like this is Shem you know Noah's son that's still alive or maybe this is even some sort of pre-incarnate you know vision of Christ you know mm-hmm. he comes and he is the he's called Melchizedek or something but I I mean, I 
truly believe this was just a just a man that happened to uh, worship God in this way, and he's going to be used for a purpose. And we'll see that purpose later on in Hebrews. I mean, he's going to be he's just going to be used as a type Mm -hmm. and an example of how Christ is going to be. And that was his sole purpose. He came, he fulfilled it in two verses, and bam, he's done. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the the fact that the Hebrew writer draws parallels between Jesus and Melchizedek, if you've never read this portion of Genesis before, you're thinking, who is this Melchizedek guy? I've got to read more. I must read more about him. He must be this incredible player within the narrative of the Bible story. And somebody say, okay, well, go go to Genesis 14 and read Genesis 14, and you'll learn about Melchizedek. And like you said, if we read two verses, 18, maybe a little more, 18, 19, 20. So three verses speak of Melchizedek. And you're thinking, how? How, how could Jesus have four Gospels and then the rest of the New Testament that teaches about him and all the, the inferences in the Old Testament about Jesus – how could somebody whose handprints are all over the Bible be compared to somebody who takes up three verses? And to me, the, the simplest explanation and understanding here is it just shows, and as you're alluding to with the Jews, it's teaching the Jews specifically that to be a part of God's people and to, to be someone very special in his eyes does not demand that he come through the line of Abraham. And it makes sense to me then that the way the Lord sets this up is it shows it shows Melchizedek interacting with Abraham. So it shows these two distinct men, one in Abraham who's going to represent an entire nation and an entire class of people, and then this other one who just simply isn't a part. And yet, who is it that Jesus is compared to? It's not Abraham. It's this man. Why? Well, because it shows that you can be a part of God's people and you can participate in God's divine purposes for us. And you can even be somebody as great as high priest before God without being a part of Abraham's family, which was one of the greatest hangups that the Jews had. How can anybody be a part of God's family unless they're a Jew first? Think about Father Abraham. They must be a child of Father Abraham if they want to be a child of God which we would then point to Galatians chapter 3 and actually the entire book of Galatians. The entire letter to the Galatians would answer that question. But specifically, Galatians chapter 3 shows that those who are true heirs and, and children of Abraham are those who simply have faith in God. And that's why we see here with Melchizedek and, and the comparison between him and Jesus. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing almost that this comparison would be made. And yet it's really just simple. It just shows that fact. That somebody can be a high priest. And the fact the only way Jesus could be our high priest is if he does it in the order of Melchizedek. Because, as we'll see once the law is introduced in, in the book of Exodus, there were only certain certain groups or a certain uh, bloodline of one of the sons of, of Jacob who could be the priest. And if you weren't of Levi, if you weren't a Levi, you could not be that priest. So how could Jesus then be a priest? Well, he did, did it in the same way that Melchizedek was able to, to perform this particular function. And just, it's incredible. I mean, absolutely incredible story. That is so short and yet has such a great impact. And yet again, on top of that, leaves us so many questions. So many <laughs> questions. Who is this guy? Where did he come from? What did and he do? And the brownies we just the, the holes in Melchizedek's story is what the Hebrew writer really draws out. Yeah. Like we I mean, we could know more about Melchizedek. I mean, I'm convinced that he actually had a father and a mother and a lineage. Because we don't have that in the scriptures, the Hebrew writer is able to use that as as the comparison for for Christ and compares comparing his priesthood uh, with uh, the priesthood of Melchizedek and making those connections that the priesthood of Melchizedek, we don't know where it started. All we know is he's a priest of the Most High God. We don't know who appointed him priest or how long, where it started. Right. Uh, and that's the point. Uh, <laughs> Jesus priesthood, there is... Uh, there is no uh, beginning and end to it. Mm-hmm. He just he is the priest, and just like Melchizedek also had the dual role of king. That was not uh, that was not what happened in the old law. Mm-hmm. The old law, the uh, the king and the priest were two separate offices, right. two different people. Well, with Jesus and the new covenant, 
that would reside in one person himself. Mm -hmm. He would be the priest and king, just like Melchizedek. So the Hebrew writer is proving that by saying, hey, this isn't the first time that happened before yes. right. with Melchizedek. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, showing showing that not everything involves Abraham is, is it was just a hard pill to swallow for for those who were of the Jewish lineage, and we can understand that. I mean, once we start, once we get to Genesis chapter twelve, literally for the rest of the the Old Testament, and even into the New Testament, everything and all all the 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 truly big players could trace themselves back to Abraham. And yet the biggest player of all Jesus, whenever they trace back his lineage, yes, they trace it to Abraham. But once he assumes this role of king and priest, they would say, well, that can't be the case because he isn't of, of Levi. True. But have you considered this man and, and how Jesus is, is playing his role in the same way that this man uh, played his role as a, as a high priest before God. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm extremely thankful for the fact that Jesus is playing that role for us as, as chief and high priest uh, before God. I want to read what is said in the text of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, let's see here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and beginning of verse 14. Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, that's Jesus. Somebody says, well, how, how could it be a high priest? He's not of Levi. He is of Melchizedek, though. He's playing, he's playing that role. But this high priest is, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. This, this aspect of Jesus' character, who he is, and the role he serves being high priest, it's not, it's not incidental, and it's not without consequence. It, it is of the greatest consequence. Just as the high priest blessed people, and that's one of the things that Melchizedek does in this text, is he begins the tradition of, of high priest blessing the people, extending blessings to them on behalf of God. That's exactly what Jesus does for us. He extends blessings to us on behalf of God. And just as a high priest made intercession between the people and God, so has Jesus made great intercession for us between, between us and our Heavenly Father. Without him, without him participating in this role, things just we, we would not have the great joy that we have now. And we would not be able to experience the, the closeness that we have with God as his children, as those who have been adopted as sons and daughters of him through Jesus. Just what a, so many people might read these three verses and say, okay, cool story, not much to it. But man, this, this is one of those texts here in Genesis 14 and verses, verses 17 through 20 that mean a lot. Though it be brief, there is a lot, there is so much meaning and, and so much uh, great importance that is found here within these verses. We didn't get a chance to finish the chapter, but it, it serves to highlight Melchizedek a little bit more. Because remember, there were two kings that came out. Ah, uh, that's Abram. true, yes. The king of Sodom as yeah, well. Yeah, Melchizedek mm -hmm. and king of Sodom. Well, who I, who I, guess, didn't, who I guess didn't fall into the, to the tar pit. Because what's interesting is we read, yeah, read so, verse yeah. 10. <laughs> now, in the, the Sedim Valley uh, contained many asphalt pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, but the rest fled to the mountains. I guess he was one of the one of the good ones who didn't fall into the tar pit. He was able to make it to this place, to this meeting. But notice notice how Abraham uh, treats Melchizedek versus his treatment of the king of Sodom. Mm -hmm. Melchizedek he he gives tithes. He's uh, he receives blessing from Mel uh, from Melchizedek. Um, eats bread and wine with him. Well, when the king of Sodom speaks. Abraham doesn't want anything to do with him. Right. The king of Sodom just says, give me all the people back, everything, you know, give me my stuff back. And Abram, you know, he's too busy being, uh, you know, raising a hand and oath to the Lord God, most high creator of earth. Mm -hmm. And I don't want any of your stuff. I don't want anyone to say that 
I have any association or I'm indebted to you at all. Who was it that Melchizedek said was the reason for Abraham's victory? In verse 20, it was uh, God most high who Mm -hmm. has handed over your enemies. Uh, So he, he clearly, and this highlights his relationship to the king of Sodom versus Lot's relationship to Sodom. Lot moved closer and closer to Mm -hmm. Sodom. Abraham is moving farther and farther away. I mean, he obviously interacts with them here, but he doesn't want to do so any more than he has to because he knows what kind kind of city, what kind of person he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Abraham is uh, making sure that those he associates with, he wants them to be people who are actually going to be a blessing to him in in his life, and he's looking at at these individuals that are that are fighting, and the whole reason they're fighting is they're not they're not willing to submit themselves to those who have had power over them. They're trying to, to usurp that power to not no longer pay this this tribute. And he's thinking, you know, this, these people are just bad news. I, I don't want to associate with them. I don't want to want to have any sort of connections to them. But this guy, this man Melchizedek, he's I can just see Abraham serving these two individuals, making judgments about these two individuals. You have this man who's got his tail between his legs because he's just been pumped by these kings, and I've had to come rescue him. And then there's this man, Melchizedek, who was a high priest of God Most High, the creator of heaven and earth. I'll tell you who I'm going to be associating with is going to be Melchizedek. I'm not going to give give too much attention to this man who who I just had to rescue. And that's, that's Abraham trying his best, at least at this point, to make sure that his associations... Are, are in the correct order, and that he's not going to be pulled down. And, and also there's there's a, in, a there seems to be an idea here that he said, you know, I, I don't want to be under your thumb. I don't want you to try to act like that you can hold this over me, that you can say, hey, I gave you these possessions, and now you owe me. Abraham says, no, I, I, I don't want that association. I'm going to stick with Melchizedek. I'll be indebted to him. I'll give tribute to him. He, he's, he's, he's in the right place. But for you... Let me have my family back. Let me have those people who matter. You keep the possessions, and we'll call everything square. We're good to go. Uh, Abraham seems to be using some some extremely good sense mm-hmm. at this time. Good judgment. Which might be might be why you know whenever we get to chapter fifteen on Friday, it's now time for the Lord to come back and to reaffirm these promises, to give him reminders, mm-hmm. because it seems that that these reminders continue to come after situations take place so there's the original promises in 12 and then after 12 he goes down to egypt and then he has this this uh separating with lots now the lord reaffirms his promises again in chapter 13 and verses uh, verses 14 through the end of the chapter then there's this other situation with these kings and having to save lot again and this interaction with Melchizedek. and now here comes the lord reaffirming these promises again and uh, there's a number of Things I think we can point out that will be really important for us to look at on Friday whenever we consider uh, Genesis 15 and 16, 17. We'll just see how far we get on on Friday. There's, there's <laughs> lots we'll to see get on to. that one. <laughs> yeah, lots to get to in these upcoming sections, but a number of good stories with good lessons for us that hopefully can, can be a blessing to us as we study through them. Alan, do you have any mm-hmm. final thoughts you want to bring up from our study for today as we've been walking through oh. uh, the, the story of Genesis? I'm just glad I didn't have to try to name all those names in chapter 14. So. <laughs> Not even going for it. You notice what I did. I mean, I just called him the king of the place. The places sometimes seem to be a little <laughs> The places easier are a little bit easier name. than the names. You're right. Yeah. That was smart. That's what you got to do. Got to got to figure that out. All right, Alan. Well, thanks so much for, for your, your help with us in our study today. I hope you enjoy the rest of this beautiful day and hope your girls are doing well and and hope my dogs are behaving well for you, too. <laughs> for all of you who have participated with us in the study, we're thankful that you have been here. We hope that you've been blessed as you've been thinking about, about God's Word this afternoon. And yeah, if you have any questions or any insights that you would like to share with us, please feel free to leave those in the comment section. And we are just thankful that you were able to participate and that we have the, the avenue uh, to do this through through Facebook and the other programs that we're using. We're thankful for those blessings that God has given to us in that way. Thank you for being here. Hope you all have a great rest of this day. Hope you'll join us again on Friday as we continue to walk through his story, looking at the, the continued story of Abraham and the covenants that God made with him and his interactions with Hagar and Sarai and just that whole, uh, we'll call it a mess, 
<laughs> just a little bit of a mess that we see in this text. Uh, but if you'd like to join us in the Bible study, we're going to be having another one tomorrow night at 6 p.m. as Austin Lewis continues to, to walk us through the book of Esther. And after he concludes Esther, he'll be getting into Ezra and Nehemiah. You're welcome to join us here on Facebook Live for that study as well. And then we'll have a short invitation and devotional that will take place around 7.30 tomorrow night. Alan Brown sent me uh, a video that I'm going to post to the website for you to draw some considerations from that he has put together for us. I appreciate his efforts in that regard. And if you do have any questions, you have any spiritual needs, you're more than welcome to reach out to us here on this Facebook page. We would love to interact with you and help you out as best we can as we all try our best to serve the Lord, even in these strange days. Hope you know that we love you so much, and we're thankful that you've been here. Hope you know that God loves you too, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, very soon, and hope you join us again as we study tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care, and God bless you in all Thank the time. Thank you.